Thank you, Mel. And good morning. How are we all doing? Yeah? All right? We loving the heat? Any, anyone struggling with the heat? Uh, a few people. Okay, not the Australians. That's good. Um, it's just really, it's just great, isn't it? Just having a bit of sunshine. It just feels like the whole of London is being, I don't know, just really being blessed this summer. You know, we had all the Jubilee stuff and then we had... Uh, all of the Olympic stuff, and now we're just kind of, it's kind of like everyone's on holiday and enjoying themselves, and there's just a really good uh, vibe around the show. And I, I came in this morning, uh, and Rod said, Darren, it's summer, just enjoy yourself. So in the next half hour, anything could happen. And we're looking at Joshua. We're in the middle of our series on Joshua. You might want to keep that open, Joshua chapter 3. That's what we're going to be looking at today. And uh, I'll pray for us before we get stuck in. Let's pray together. Let's ask for God's help. Lord, we thank you for creation. We thank you that we can enjoy the sun. We thank you that we can enjoy this weather. We thank you, Lord, that we can bask in the sun. And we know that it's just a small foretaste of your glory, Lord. It's a small foretaste of the enjoyment that we're going to have in your presence, Lord, after the resurrection. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us through scripture. And Lord, I ask now that you'll send your Holy Spirit on all of us this morning, that you'll turn our hearts and our minds and our lives towards you, that you'll remind us of Jesus in everything that we hear and that we'll know him better and love him better and serve him better at the end of our time together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good. So last week, Rod reminded us how to read the Old Testament, to read the Old Testament in the way that Jesus read the Old Testament. He pointed us back to Luke chapter 24, verse 26, after the resurrection, where we read that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And we looked at John chapter 5, verse 39, where Jesus says to the Pharisees, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that bear witness about me. And Jesus is saying that all of the scriptures are about him. The whole of the Old Testament is all about him. The whole of the New Testament is all about him. The whole of the Bible is about Jesus. Every chapter, every book, every verse is all about Jesus. And so when we come to Joshua chapter 3 then, when we come to this passage where Israel is crossing the Jordan, this isn't just a bit of distant history that has no relevance to us. This isn't just a set of past events that happened to someone else that has no bearing on how we live our lives. Because crossing the Jordan was always about Jesus. It was always about Israel's Messiah, And Jesus himself wanted us to know this when Jesus crossed the Jordan. Jesus crossed the Jordan. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John tried to put him off and Jesus said, this is what needs to happen now. This is the right way to complete God's plan to put things right. My translation. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water and suddenly the heavens were opened, we read, and he saw God's spirit descending on him like a dove. So Jesus thinks that Israel crossing the Jordan is so much about who he is, is so significant for his ministry that he repeats it. He repeats it. He acts it out publicly. He acts it out symbolically at the beginning of his ministry. As he's baptized in the Jordan, symbolically he's crossing over into the promised land. And he's saying, you remember what was going on back there in Joshua? Well, go look at that and that will tell you something about what I'm doing now. He's saying, if you want to understand what I'm doing, who I am, what I'm about, then read Joshua and that will tell you what I'm doing. Everything that I'm doing will make more sense. And Rod also reminded us that Jesus and Joshua are at at heart the same name. So Joshua is a shortened version of Hebrew Yehoshua, which means Yahweh, the Lord, saves. Yahweh is the name of the God of Israel. And Jesus is the Greek version of the same name, Yehoshua, Yahweh saves. 
So it's with all of that that we come to Joshua chapter 3. Early in the morning, Jesus, or Joshua, and all the Israelites set out. So Jesus is leading, Joshua is leading the people of Israel. Joshua is leading the people of Israel. So what's going on? Who are these people? Who are the Israelites? What's happening here? If we asked an Israelite what was going on, what would they say? What would they understand about who they were here and what was happening to them? Alec Matea, a theologian, says something like this. Something like this. He says, here's what an Israelite would say if you asked them, what's going on? Who are you? An Israelite would say something like this. He'd say, I was in a foreign land under sentence of death. I was in slavery, but I took shelter under the blood of the lamb and I was rescued. And there was a man who spoke to God on our behalf, a mediator, and he led us out like an army and we crossed over and now we're on our way to the promised land. And we're not there yet, but he's given us the law so that we can be a community and know how to get on together. He's given us sacrifice in the tabernacle because we need forgiveness and reconciliation with God. And God's presence is always in our midst. And he's going to stay with us so we can worship him. And he's going to bring us home. And when we get home, we're going to invite the whole world to come and worship this God, the God who's rescued us and who lives in our midst. That's what an Israelite would say. And that's what's going on here in this passage. And it should sound very familiar to anyone here who's a Christian today. Because God is teaching this random group of economic migrants in this passage how to be his people. God is teaching this group of people how to be Israel. How to be Israel. And that's what we might want to learn this morning. That's what we might want to think about this morning. How to be Israel. How to be God's people in East London. So there's a few things we're going to look at. First of all, let God lead the way. Let God lead the way. Go God's way into the land of promise. Verse 6 reads, take the Ark of the Covenant and pass ahead of the people. Verse 11, the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Verse 14, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. We're supposed to notice that the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. The Ark of the Covenant is leading the way into the Jordan. And the Ark of the Covenant is the place where God's glory appears. It's just a box. It's just a box. But inside it are the tablets with the words of the covenant on it. The covenant given to Moses. In fact, there's three things in there. There's, there's, there's Aaron's staff as well, which was a sign of God's power, and a pot of manna, which is a sign of God's provision for his people. But wherever the Ark of the Covenant went, that was where God's glory would appear. Wherever the ark goes, that's where God goes. The ark leads the way. In effect, the Holy Spirit is leading the way through the words of the covenant. Through the words of the covenant. And we have those words today. We have those words in our Bibles. The Bible is the offer of God's relationship based on a promise. So God's people are led by the Holy Spirit, leading and guiding through God's word. So being Israel involves God's guidance, God's leading, and secondly, it involves God's power. Verse 5, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, that means make yourselves holy, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. God is going to do a miracle He's going to do an amazing act of power. He's going to hold back the Jordan. And this is the time of the spring harvest, we learn later. The river is at its widest and its deepest. It's maybe a half a mile wide, maybe three meters deep. And God is going to hold back the water so that his people can march on dry land into the land of promise. And as he does that, nature is being transformed. Nature is being transformed so that it can be a perfect place for God's people to walk through, so that it can be at the service of God's people. But do you see how this miracle happens after the people of God do what? They consecrate themselves. They make themselves holy. 
They make themselves holy. That's what they have to do first. And that means sorting their life out. It means confessing sin. It means coming to God in prayer. For the Israelites, it would also mean symbolic actions of commitment to God, like washing themselves, abstaining from alcohol, maybe abstaining from sexual relationships with their spouse for a period. They're being asked to hand over their lives to God first, to put right what's wrong, to pray, to confess sin, to prepare to come into the presence of God as he goes ahead of them. And then God does miracles. And the amazing thing is that praying and confessing sin, it's not that there's some kind of magic link between them and miracles, it's that praying and confessing sin is already a miracle. Coming to God in prayer is already a miracle. Thinking about being holy is already a sign of God's power at work in our lives. John Piper, the American pastor, puts it like this. He says, when it comes to killing my sin, I don't wait for a miracle, I act the miracle. When it comes to killing my sin, I don't wait for a miracle, I act the miracle. And that's what Israel does before they cross over the Jordan. They act like the people of God, and God's power makes them act like the people of God. And they're consecrated, they're made holy, and nature parts so that they can pass over nature at the service of God's people, just like it was always supposed to be back in Genesis. John Wesley, the Anglican preacher, said, Give me ten men who hate only sin and fear only God, and we will change the world. Hate sin, fear God, and see miracles as God changes the world. Because being Israel means consecrating ourselves, making ourselves holy, and expecting God's power to be at work in our lives together. So how to be Israel? It involves God's guidance, it involves God's power, and thirdly, it involves God's plan. What is God's plan? Well, the plan that God's committed him to is his covenant, it's his promise, uh, it's his mission, And that mission, it it can be summed up very short, you know, in just a few words. His mission is to rescue the world. His mission is to rescue the world, to bring the world back out of the bad mistakes and the sin and the errors that we've made and to bring us back into relationship with him. That's what God wants to do, to rescue the world. He says to Abraham, he promises to Abraham, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And this is the plan. And it is going to happen. God's going to welcome all the nations of the earth into his covenant people, into the people that he's promised to be with, into the people that he's promised to live among and rescue and bring home. And that's the plan, the whole earth rescued. Anything else isn't God's plan. That's the only plan God's got. Rescue the world. That's what it's all about. And we Christians, we Israelites, we're very good these days at finding other plans and other projects to distract us from the main job, from the main mission. And the main mission is God's plan to rescue the whole earth, the whole earth. A bit over 1,400 years ago, 595, the year of our Lord, and a man called Augustine was chosen by church leaders in Rome to go on a mission. And he was going to lead a mission to share the gospel, to take the good news of God's plan to rescue the whole world. And he was going to take this news to a group of pagan Germanic kingdoms, on a relatively large island off the coast of of northern Europe. That was his mission. He took a a group of 40 men with him, and his journey took nearly two years. In 597, Augustine and his mission team landed in Kent. And within a couple of years, thousands and thousands of people were getting baptized. 
Thousands and thousands of people were getting baptized. Augustine's mission was to convert England. To convert England. He didn't set out thinking he was going to set up a couple of small groups or a few churches. He was going to convert England. Because he had his eyes on God's plan, which was to rescue all of the nations of the world. And it's God's plan, but Augustine and his team, they worked hard. They worked hard. If they were going to convert a nation, they had to think about what the gospel would look like when it came to economics, what the gospel and community would look like when they came together, what gospel and family would look like when they came together, what the gospel would mean for education and for schools. They had to think about all of these things. But Augustine had God's plan in front of him. And we still live out of the spiritual capital of Augustine's work. And this is what's happening in Joshua chapter 3, verse 4, I think. Joshua says, don't come near the ark. Stand back. Get God's perspective. Essentially, he's saying, look at what's happening with God's plans in mind. When the Israelites have to stand back, Essentially, they're about 900 meters away from the ark, so they have to stand back so they can see exactly where it's going, exactly what's happening, exactly where they're supposed to be. Stand back and get God's perspective. God's plan is to save the whole earth, and that should be our plan too, here in East London. This should be at the top of our list of you know, priorities. Mission, rescue London. And fourthly, being Israel means that it's God's battle. It's God's battle. Israel, the name given uh, to God's people in the Old Testament and, and the New Testament, Israel, the very name means God fights. It means God fights. And here in Joshua chapter 3, verse 10, we read, This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. So God's going to drive out all of these nations. At this point in history, we're about the late Bronze Age when this is happening, a long time ago, a number of people groups had already decided to say no to God's offer of a covenant of peace. A number of nations had already decided to say no to being part of the people of God. And if they'd stayed in the land, Israel would have been destroyed. It simply wasn't going to work. And so God says that these nations can't stay there, that they need to be destroyed. That's the word. It sounds awful. It should do. And he's going to do it by letting Israel defeat them in battle. I think this is meant to sound bad. It's meant to sound bad. I think there are lots of issues here. We can't look at all of them this morning, but I would strongly recommend, if you've got time, uh, to look at this book uh, called uh, Show Them No Mercy, where there are four theologians who basically discuss the various you know, issues that are at stake here. Uh, if you haven't got time to read the whole book, it's divided into four parts, and the fourth part is probably um, one of the most interesting uh, bits of the book. Um, but I think this is meant to sound bad. The destruction of life should never sound good to us. It should never be something for us to celebrate. But there's one thing that we do need to focus on, though, and that's that this is primarily, primarily a spiritual battle. You know, we often say, don't we, that that this is a spiritual, we often say that we fight a spiritual battle. Back then they did the real thing, but now we do a spiritual battle. But I think that's wrong. I think the whole significance of this is that it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. When the Egyptian army was destroyed, It wasn't about some some men dying in the Red Sea. It was celebrated as Yahweh's victory over the gods of Egypt. It was a spiritual battle. And the issue with these nations is the gods that they worship and follow. It's the gods that they worship and follow. That's what makes this a spiritual fight. And we are part of this spiritual battle today. Israel, God fights And Yahweh fights and conquers the gods of Egypt. Yahweh fights and conquers the gods of Canaan. 
Yahweh fights and will conquer the gods of East London. And what we need to get from this is that just because this is a spiritual battle, it doesn't mean that human lives aren't still at stake. You know, this is still a matter of life and death. Will people respond to the good news of God's plan to rescue the world, or will they say, no, thanks? It's a matter of life and death. And I have to say that I don't organize my life as if that's the case most of, most of the time. You know, I have to come, come you know, stand here and say, you know, when it comes to this issue, you know, there's, there's a lot for me to do. Because... When it comes to going out of my way to bless the people around me with good news, I don't do it as much as I could do. And I'm so grateful for everything that God has done in my life. I'm so grateful for how God rescued me. But I'm slow to invite other people to get rescued too. Why is that? Because it's a battle because it's a fight, I expect it to be easy. It's never going to be easy. It's a battle. It's easier just to get along with people. And that's exactly what the Israelites preferred to do too. That's exactly what the Israelites here in Joshua 3 preferred to do as well. Fast forward to Judges chapter 3, verse 5, where we read, The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. They lived among them. That's not what they were supposed to do. They lived among them. They hadn't gone into battle with them. They didn't clear them out of the land like they were supposed to. And what was the consequence? Verse 6, they took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. Verse 7, they forgot Yahweh their God and served the Baals and the Asherah. That's what happens when Israel doesn't join God's spiritual battle in the way that he asked them to. And today, here in East London, we need to join in the battle as well. The battle against these spiritual powers, the spiritual powers that these gods represent. Because the effects of worshipping other gods in that culture then are the same as the things that we see around us in our culture when people worship other gods. Things like prostitution, like adultery, polygamy, the buying and selling of women and, women and slaves, children sacrificed for comfort or for career, neglect of the poor, love of money, families broken or destroyed, wherever the God of Israel isn't loved and trusted and something else or someone else is, there's a battle to be fought and we're asked to fight it. And yes, we fight with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of truth, and we hold out God's offer of intimate relationship based on a promise. But it's a battle. It's a battle. It's God's battle. Learning how to be Israel then involves God's leading, being guided by God's covenant word and spirit, it involves God's power, making ourselves holy and expecting God to do amazing stuff. It involves God's plan, being on mission to save the whole earth. It involves God's battle, joining in the spiritual fight to get rid of the gods of the nations and see Yahweh worshipped and loved. That's what being Israel means. And of course, here in Joshua, we know, we're going to find out very quickly that Israel can't do it. We're going to find out that Israel can't do it. They can't follow God's word. They forget to depend on God and they expect him to do stuff for them without them even bothering about him. They forget about the other nations really quickly. You know, telling them about God just disappears off the agenda very quickly. And when it comes to fighting, just like me, they're cowards. And that's the problem with God's people in Joshua. They don't seem able to be the people of God. They don't know how to be Israel. And what they do know about, they tend to mess up and turn into religion. How can this be sorted out? How can this be sorted out? How can this be put right? How can Israel be what it's supposed to be? How can we be what we're supposed to be? 
Well, there was one Israelite who crossed the Jordan and did everything right. Jesus was the perfect Israelite. Jesus was the perfect Israelite. So when it, come, when it came to God's leading, Jesus lived and breathed and cried and bled God's covenant word and lived every part of his life in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when it came to God's power, Jesus made himself holy and resisted temptation and the power of the Holy Spirit rested on him to forgive and to heal and to restore And when it came to God's plan, Jesus was so full on for God's plan to rescue the world that he was prepared to die for it. And when it came to God's battle, Jesus wasn't afraid to go into battle with Satan, even though he knew that he would be handed over, even though he knew that he'd be flogged and crucified, even though he knew that he'd be killed. Jesus was the perfect Israelite. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, he showed that he had gone through the Jordan and he had come out into the land of promise. And now nature had been transformed. He had a new physical transformed resurrection body. And the land of promise was his inheritance. He's the only one who's inherited the land of promise. And it was his to give to anyone who trusted him. It was his to give away to anyone who trusted him as Lord, who trusted him as King. And we can see now what Israel then couldn't see. We can see now what Israel then couldn't know, that the resurrection of the Messiah, the resurrection of Jesus, says that God has accepted Jesus' life as perfect, that God is making the Messiah's people, Israel, perfect, that God is bringing his people Israel home to the land of promise and Jesus is leading the way. And anyone, everyone, whoever you are, who comes to Jesus saying, lead the way for me, anyone who comes to Jesus saying, help me to hate sin and love God, help me to make God's rescue plan for the world the blueprint for my life, Help me to fight the idols and false gods that enslave me and other people. Anyone who comes to Jesus and says, help me with this, Jesus says, yes, I will. And I'll send the Holy Spirit and he'll be in you and I'll be in you and you'll be in me and I'll be in the Father and we'll all do this thing together and we'll all crack this Israel thing together. Joshua chapter 3. Israel, the people of God, thought that crossing the Jordan was all about a patch of land and some neighbours they weren't sure they'd get on with, but they eventually did, and too well. And what they'd failed to notice is that something bigger was being promised to them. You know, the word for land and earth are the same in Hebrew, They're the same in Hebrew. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The land is the same word. The patch of earth in the Middle East that they were walking into was a sign. It was a foretaste. It was a first deposit of the whole earth which was going to be given to the people of God. And what they'd failed to notice is that the real battle... The real battle they needed to be fighting with God was to invite the whole earth to join them. Israel was meant to be showing their neighbours the one true God and instead Israel settled for a patch of land in the Middle East and they turned their back on God's mission. Are we going to make the same mistake? Are we going to make the same mistake? Are we going to settle for church just being about what a couple of hundred people do here on a Sunday? Or are we hungry for East London, the whole of East London, to be worshipping Jesus? Are we content to see God not at work at all in areas of our lives because it's too much effort for us? Or are we desperate to see the Holy Spirit transform our whole lives, our whole families, all of our relationships, everything, 
And do we think that mission is about ignoring the spiritual death of our neighbours? About getting alongside them as they worship completely other gods than the God who made heaven and earth? Or are we talking about God's offer, holding out his offer of peace to anyone and everyone? We know something that the Israelites back then didn't. We've got something that they didn't have. Jesus has gone through the Jordan and the whole earth is his inheritance. He offers it to his people today and he asks us to join him in inviting others to cross over the Jordan into the land of promise. That's God's plan. That's God's vision. That's the mission that breaks God's heart to rescue the whole world, to see the whole of this city worshipping Jesus. And this plan, this mission, this vision is what drives our church. This mission is what should be driving our small groups and our connect groups. This mission, this plan is what should be at the heart of our families, transforming them. The whole of London saved And this is going to happen. You know, if you just read scripture through to the end, all of the nations and the glory of the nations will be brought into God's presence. And and that's what's going to happen. That's the only plan that's happening. And Jesus has led the way. This is what's coming. Are we up for it? Do we want to join in? Do we want to play our part? Do we want to be Israel? Do we want to be Israel in East London. Let's pray together. Shall we stand?